to extend on that, the absence of a value proposition, the only thing you've got to compete on is price. My name is Peter Sumpton, and this is the Marketing Study Lab podcast. A podcast for those that are thinking, have thought and are doing, or already have a marketing qualification. But there's a little bit of something for everyone as we cover a whole host of marketing topics. I chat to some amazing guests, each one a superstar in their own niche. And if you have a burning marketing question already or after this episode, get in touch. We'll chat it through. Peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk or find me on LinkedIn. The link is in the show notes. If you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, this will really help others find this podcast and spread the marketing word. Now let's get on with today's episode. We all seem to be focusing on the digital elements of not only our marketing, but our business and social lives as well. Sometimes it's easy to forget that there's a real world in all of this and how physical evidence can play a huge part in your marketing mix. More on that later. First, it's time to chat with Michael Field about all things B2B, business to business. It's so easy to focus on the B2C, business to consumer, elements of marketing. They are all around us and impact us every day, but the majority of us will ply our trade within the B2B sector And Michael is the perfect person to guide us through what we should be doing within this sector. Michael, who is also a guest lecturer at Edith Cowan University for a number of years, now focuses on developing competitive strategies for medium-sized businesses for Evitfield partners. Michael specialises in helping his clients gain market share, build compelling value propositions, identify value drivers, and develop meaningful, evidence-based, and actionable strategic plans. Now, this may all sound very buzzwordy, but believe me, when Michael talks, you listen as there is theory and analysis behind what he offers, building the solid foundations of marketing that are so badly missed in many, many, many organizations' strategies. But all that's very deep. So I wanted to know initially, being an ex-lecturer and all that, Michael, how many decimal places can you remember in Pi? And don't let me down here. None. I Google everything. (laughs) Yeah, great answer. I would have said that as well. Um, That went straight out of my head as soon as I uh, left the maths class, I think. I I learned quite early in the piece that you don't need to remember anything like that if you can Google it. Um, so unless unless you require that to land an aeroplane or a spaceship or something, I I don't keep such facts in my head. <laughs> yeah, they they haven't let me on a um or let me fly an aeroplane or a spaceship. So I think we're all safe on that one. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay, let's get more serious now. What's what's the story that's brought you to this stage of your career as a um, competitive strategy consultant for B two B organisations? Sure. Most of my career has been in organisations that were preparing for some form of growth or change, and they happened to be coincidentally in B2B. And I really learnt on the job that B2B was my preference because I always found uh, consumer marketing um, to be... um, in some ways, somewhat wishy-washy. I don't think that it's got the same sort of precision around it. And I'll use a simple example is that, you know, if somebody is going to be specking out 15 new, you know, uh, forklifts for their warehouse, there's not many emotional drivers that you can use um, to convince them that it's a good business case. Um, so, look, I started my career in in um, in publishing. So, um, you know, pre-internet days, I spent you know seven or eight years in a um, strategy, advertising, and marketing role in um, in publishing. I tilted into online marketing in around 2000. So, uh, went through um, you know the exciting ride of the launch of the internet, and have worked in a variety of B two B businesses, and they're private owned, privately owned, but all of them were at some level gearing for a substantial change. And quite often that was an ownership change. Um, About 10 years ago, I made the call that um, I'd really done 
most everything that is possible in a marketing role from you know learning the basics around copywriting and ads and you know design and marketing plans through to investor relations and capital raising and you know um, television production and all these sorts of things and I decided about a decade ago that I would um, hang out my shingle and um, uh, apply my craft uh, to my own customer base and um, been successfully doing that for the last decade. Fantastic. So quite um, quite a, a structured approach to where you are at the moment, which is uh, which which is always good to see. You, usually, people fall into marketing, so it's always nice to speak to somebody that's had that that background and and, and practices what they preach. <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, there's um, there's it, it, things look look structured in hindsight. You know, I have to say that there's a lot of um, luck and opportunity um, in what you do and um, capturing those along the way. So quite often you don't, you may not know where you're actually going to be in five years' time, but you know what you're looking for. So when that opportunity comes up, you're well positioned for it. Excellent. So can you just explain what a competitive strategy consultant for specifically B two B organisations actually does? Sure. B2B uh, very often has very, very specialised skills inside the business in operations and manufacturing and logistics and sourcing and a whole range of other areas where they um, tend to be less developed in their thinking is in marketing and marketing strategy and in particular competitive strategy. So a business may have grown up from being a you know, two, three, five million dollar business into a $20 million business just because they're really good at making a widget or sourcing it or value adding it. And what we find is that they very often stumble um, to the next level of growth. They can't get from 20 to 40 or 20 to 50. Um, they don't know how to do that. Um, so the competitive competitive strategy piece is actually the linkage between the organisational strategy and the marketing strategy. And I'll give you a, an example of sort of worst practice and then best practice if that helps. Absolutely. Uh, very often an organisation who's at that 20 million stage might say, and I'll just use that as an example, that might be the growth plateau that they find themselves grumbling along on and they decide that the um, the missing link in their growth strategy is marketing. So they employ a marketing manager and they give that marketing manager a budget and they don't really know how to brief that marketing manager or to tell them what to do. So the marketing manager does a couple of things. They change the logo, they redo the website and they spiffy up all the brochures and 24 months into that, program, there's been no material difference on top line revenue growth or bottom line profitability. And um, the, you know, the owners and directors of the business wondered what happened. So what we do is we work with boards and leadership teams and management teams. We help um, unpick and pressure test the, um, the organisational strategy and particularly their growth targets. We pressure test whether or not they're real, market size, competitive tensions, margins, distribution channels. We form a view as to the most effective way for them to reach their revenue growth targets. And then we build the foundations and, and build the platform to make that happen. And then a marketing manager can plug in and do those other things. They can work on brand and brochures and you know product and these um, um, uh, sales collateral, but it's, but it's actually built on a much stronger foundation which is evidence-based yeah I, I think that's absolutely bang on evidence-based strong foundations and it's the part uh, I, I've just done a, a two-day workshop on marketing strategy and okay. one of those two days was just completely on where you are now and the, the models and tools that we can use to look at these strong foundations and then the second day was looking at that strategic approach and the tactics to, yes. to, to help you achieve whatever objectives you set and it's that part that people don't get that they like the, t the top of the iceberg that they can see yes. because they can relate to that because they can see it but it's the yes. like you say the foundation that bottom bit that people don't necessarily understand so it's great to hear that particularly from a b2b perspective as well thanks uh, I think something like eight out of 10 businesses or, or something like that last time I checked in the UK anyway, will fail or they say will fail within the first 18 months. Why do you think that rate is so high? Business failure is um, 
is predictable and the rate hasn't actually changed that much over the years and it's not that much different from market to market so even with all the startups and incubators and these types of things these business accelerators the failure rate is the same and um, frankly it's the fundamentals very often um, business um, owners or people who are going to start a business um, they may be very good at good at a particular thing or they might have a particular passion for something but they have very often um, allowed their emotional connection to that idea to cloud their business judgment in terms of is this something that would pass muster from third party investment. So I might be willing to put my discretionary effort into building this idea. I might be willing to do that, um, but it may not actually translate into a commercial success. And um, even if it achieves modest success, it may not have the fundamentals in place where you could get additional funding or secure high quality staff to build that to the next level. So I think it's it's very much a um, but I say this in a respectful way because I really value and appreciate the energy and effort that goes into the startup space and the risk that people are willing to take. But from my perspective, you know, you you, you are much better served by de-risking that by by investing in you know the fundamentals, the market research, the um the um, market analysis, and really proving up a business case. And if it doesn't pass muster with a third party, if you look at it, get an investor to look at it, and they say you know this doesn't look right to us, um, then maybe you don't want to spend the next couple of years putting your own discretionary effort into it, trying to build something that that doesn't have the fundamentals in place. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you, you, you clearly work with a lot of B2B businesses. Yes. In terms of marketing strategy, is there a difference between B2B and B2C? And if so, what does that look like? Because I think it, it's easy to, to relate and understand to the B2C because we're all consumers. But the B2B sure. kind of perspective, it can sometimes go go missing. Sure. Look, there are there are many people who would argue um, different ways around it. Some people say, you know, there is no B2B or B2C, it's all P2P, it's all person to person or something like that. But but I would argue quite strongly that B2B is a very different marketplace from B2C. Um, your, your, um, the expectation from the customer that you've got a must, much more sophisticated business case rationale as to why your product is superior to the competitors um, over and above emotional or brand reasons is is essential to 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 create any success for a business. You know, the the um, I said somewhat tongue tongue in cheek earlier. A warehouse manager is who's specking out you know fifteen forklifts needs a business case. They need to know that you understand deeply the business problems that they're experiencing. You need to know everything about inventory and logistics and dispatch and exactly how those forklifts are going to be used. Um, and you need to be willing to have a a much longer sales cycle or sales conversation with that person over a protracted period. And you need to be willing to negotiate with multiple parts of the business. Although the order might come from the warehouse manager or procurement, there's probably 15 or 20 people who would be influencing that decision from the user, the forklift operator, the OH&S guy, um, you know, various people in that business who are going to have a view as to what capital equipment they want in the business. And um, B2B marketers and B2B salespeople need to be willing to understand that landscape, um, be expert in it and invest in that much longer term conversation um, that, look, frankly, can't be solved in a 30 second TVC or a, you know, a, a, a cutesy point of sale. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of that cutesy point of sale, uh, I just want to speak um, on the tactical point of view, uh, if you like. So when you're working with organisations, is it now all about the, the digital or is there still a need for a more traditional element within our marketing? It definitely has substantially tilted towards digital, and that's um, not because of the tools. It's actually because of the buyer behaviour. So, you know, for example, pre pre internet, uh, if you wanted to buy a piece of business equipment like a photocopier, you would call three 
photocopy companies and you would ask the rep to come out and they would do a presentation of their product and you had no capacity to research that yourself or form any views yourself as to what might be the best product for you. Um, in a hyper-connected digital age, the um, the recent stats that we've um, been reading is anywhere between 80 and 94% of the purchase decision is made before they speak to a vendor. Um, so unless you are heavily invested in furnishing your prospective customers with information, um, and that's omni-channel, that's, that's video, that's podcasts, that's blogs, that's keynotes, uh, you name it, um, unless you're prepared to invest in that omni-channel, you're denying yourself the opportunity to put your brand even into the consideration set of the customer. Um, so the, the spend on digital is just going through the roof in B2B. Uh, that being said, I don't think it's that well understood. And a lot of people are still doing kind of um, quite traditional advertising messages, but just pushing them down a digital channel. And I think that's a mistake. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I think because of the, the speed and the rate of change, it, it, we're almost trying to catch up with these various channels. And it can be... It, it can be very overwhelming if, if you don't understand the nuances of a particular channel and then you've got multiple channels that you need to understand that are very different. Uh, I think it, it's very easy to trip yourself up when you're looking at these things. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, one, if you look at it um, you know, through the lens of your earlier question, um, is it all digital? Um, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, I look at it and think, well, what are some of the mistakes that you see most often occur? One is the belief that you have to be in all channels, which is just isn't the case. Um, unless you're looking at it through the lens of where are my customers? Where, what it, where are the locations where my prospective customers are assembling? And what information are they looking for there when they assemble? Um, so that's platform agnostic. That's not privileging Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest or LinkedIn or, or any other platform. It's purely looking through the customer lens and customer segmentation. And then the next, so the first, the first you know, error or decision point is channel selection um, based on customer um, concentration. And then the second one is messaging. Um, and, you know, like I say, we often see um, very traditional sort of brochureware type ads being pushed down digital channels that have got no relevance whatsoever to the customer. So they get um, justifiably ignored. I, I cannot emphasize that enough to, to listeners. You, you put that so eloquently. The fact that it's, it's not for us to decide um, what channels we want to use. It's where our cons consumers, our customers are and where they're congregating. Massively important. It's a, it's, I'm glad you said that. It's a really important point because um, our job as marketers is to be um, really custodians of the client brand. Um, and we're, but we're, we're custodians of the client brand, but we're guardians of the customer. As in, our job is to negotiate between the business and the customer, the needs of the customer and how the business can satisfy those needs, not the demands of the business and how we can foist them upon the customer. And 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 it and it's a very courageous position to take. And people who are early in their marketing um, career might feel compelled to just um, um, follow um, the requests of the business. But um, if you can build an evidence case to say, listen, I know you'd like to do this and we, you think we should be on Pinterest, but the research that I've done here tells me that we've got a high concentration of customers on LinkedIn or more of them are actually joining this forum. And from a return on effort, before you look at return on investment, just purely from a return on effort um, in a marketing team, we would likely get a higher return on effort by investing in this channel rather than that channel and here's my evidence for it most businesses will celebrate that type of feedback and it's a really valuable um, learning for an early marketer to say hey my job is to actually understand the customer and bring those needs to the business and help the business satisfy those needs you need to come and sit on my shoulder when i'm doing workshops and seminars <laughs> you really do i'd love to do that <laughs> <laughs> i think we, i think we'd have great fun <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah yeah too right um mm. so you've spoken in the past about a value proposition what mm. do you mean by this and why is it important sure a, a, a value proposition again it's often a misunderstood term many people um, think that a value proposition is some type of tagline or strap line um, that's attached to a brand that's going to convince every customer to do business with you whereas a, a value proposition is a is a um, a series of um, 
um, both insights and statements and communications that deeply resonate with the customer need that help the customer understand that you understand them and you can solve their business problem. And a value proposition, um, in the first instance, there does need to be a, um, an umbrella value proposition that reflects how the how the brand and how the business satisfies customers and understands their needs. But as you get down into the segmentation of your customer base, and that's not just industry segmentation, it's really important that there are different buyers and different buyer types with different needs. You need to customise that value proposition to that um, specific customer. And um, it, it it, it takes time to get it right and it needs to be pressure tested again with the customer. It needs to be sort of taken through the cauldron of competitive tension and say, after that, does it still stand up? Is it still unique and defensible? Um, and more importantly, can we deliver on it? So it's um, it's not just a series of claims and statements about quality and service and people and experience. It's a, it's a provable set of facts about demonstrated understanding of the customer needs, uh, defensible against the crosswinds of competitive tension and um, and uh, genuinely able to be delivered on by the organisation. So those customers who experience that will say, I don't know how, but those guys get it. They get me and I'm, I'm, I'm not only will I stick with them, but I'll advocate for them and become a brand ambassador. And that starts with the value proposition. And um, to extend on that, the absence of a value proposition, the only thing you've got to compete on is price. Mm -hmm. If someone's sitting there and they've got three vendors and they don't know the difference between vendor A, B and C, you literally are just entering an auction or well, a reverse auction where the customer said, well, who's prepared to give me that for the cheapest? And uh, a value proposition helps you fight out of price-based competition and really prosecute the capabilities of your organisation to a customer who cares for those things. And there's nothing like hiding behind a couple of lines or statements that your your company <laughs> ad adheres to um, in, yeah. in, uh, in speech marks. Look, we, we push that really hard with our customers and um, we pose the question to them, which is, what do you do differently or better than your competitors that your customer cares so deeply about they would be prepared to pay a premium? And if you can answer that question without saying quality service, people experience or range, then we might be able to have a compelling conversation. <laughs> That's brilliant. You can imagine saying that and saying, but you're not allowed to use these words. Oh, um <laughs> it, it it frankly leaves most people tongue tied and we say look we're not being difficult we're not trying to make your life difficult what we're saying is that and the reason we we exclude those words from a value proposition is that um you simply need to look at your three closest competitors websites and see whether or not they're saying oh we've got okay quality and moderate people and somewhat product you know they're all saying exactly the same thing so the point about not saying them isn't that you don't have them or they're not true the point about not saying them is that they're not compellingly different so they're not competitive um, at a more strategic like high level have you seen a change in marketing strategies over the past decade Yes, and 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 it it just is increasingly becoming customer centric, um, and I know that that is a buzzword, and um, and and I don't intend to to leave it there. Um, brands used to be able to rely on their brand to get them through, um, and whether that's B two C or B two B, you know, whether that's Levi's or Toshiba or you know whoever that may be, but the 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 customer is entirely in charge of the buying process. They have unlimited choice. They the, the, the last stats I saw, and these get updated all the time, is that a customer sees something like 3,000 marketing messages per day. They are tuning out in droves. Marketers have not sufficiently adapted to the fact that the the customer segments that they're targeting don't care about their message. And that, um, you know, um, old school, big brand, you know, storyboard type stuff um, is not compelling enough to convince a customer to stay to stay loyal to you. Um, but it's also not compelling enough to get a new customer to try you. Uh, absolutely. And, and that brings me nicely on to, to my next question uh, about the more uh, the, the measurements and the metrics. Is it possible to sure. run a, a, a marketing campaign without these numbers and figures? And, and if not, what metrics should we be looking at to make sure we get the best chance of success? Sure. 
most um, most marketers are, are are in a position where the organisation is demanding measurement from them, and most marketers are in a position where they don't know how to answer the question. So the reality is that that ROI um, or just key performance metrics around the campaign, um, in many instances, are still limited to um, uh, to numbers that don't matter that much. Um, and what I mean by that is if you go back to some of the older school traditional marketing like um, magazine advertising, they'd talk about circulation and they'd talk about readership and those are the metrics that they, you know, that message was, you know, put in front of 300,000 people. Um, you, ca you, you, can't, you can't pay bills with readership. Um, you know, what you need is um, qualified conversions and loyal customers who are staying on and spending and, expand, and extending their, their spend within your organisation. So, you know, the, the metrics that matter, you do need to start with reach and frequency and awareness and um, these sorts of things. Um, but unless you're linking that and hardwiring that back to the organisation's sales, um, understanding what the marketing activity was over a 12-month period, understanding what the marketing cost was, and understanding the direct impact that that had on sales that has got a provable link back to the marketing, in my mind now is a requirement from most boards and most executive teams, and most marketers and marketing teams are scrambling to get up to that standard with their work. And if you get it right, you're, you know, you're creating tremendous value for, for the organisation that you're working for. I think a lot a lot of people can class some of those as, as vanity metrics, uh, engagement. We talk about reach, likes, comments, shares, and all that those kind of stuff. More yes. the, the the social elements. But if you look at those in isolation, absolutely, they, like you said, don't pay the bills. But mm. in in a whole campaign, in a whole strategy, it, it just highlights the fact that at one element you're doing something correct, and if nothing is coming yes. through the the funnel, if you a traditional sales sure. funnel, if you like then you've got a problem at a particular stage and it can highlight that. So in its, uh, if, you, if you're going to single that out, yeah, it's probably a vanity metric, but in, in its entirety, it can prove worth looking at and valuable. Absolutely, I, I should point out. I, um, I, I um, they have a, a really important role to play in understanding lead source and lead generation, and um, they are also a terrific indicator of the quality of the content that you're producing. So, you know, for example, if you produce a piece of content and get really good reach on that content, but but um, suboptimal engagement, maybe that content needed reviewing maybe the targeting wasn't quite right as in it was good content just reaching the wrong people so so you're right each of those measures is a um, a feedback loop in the marketing engine um but it but it but it doesn't actually provide the information about roi it just provides information around marketing performance so if you can link those things back and say right um we feel confident that we've isolated the right segment and right group of customers. We've got the right bucket of customers and we've created this really fantastic content. Let's distribute that content and see how they engage. If they don't engage, you, you like I say, you question those two things. Do we have the right customers? Do we have the right content? So you work on those. And if they're engaging, you're getting a lot of likes and shares and comments and these sorts of things, but it's not generating inquiries then you might look at it and say, is our call to action strong enough? Is our offer strong enough? Have we given them a compelling reason to you know, exchange their contact details or self-select into some sort of sales funnel? So you're absolutely right. All of those things are tremendously valuable in the marketing function, but at an executive level, when they're assessing a performance of the marketing campaign, they want to know further down the chain how that translated into revenue. Um, they're kind of interested in those top line numbers because they go, they're good things for marketers to focus on. But help me understand, you know, what is the volume and quality of new leads that it generated? Um, what is our conversion rate? And what's the total revenue derived from that campaign? Absolutely. Uh, that leads us nicely on to some quick fire questions. Are you ready? Fire away. I am. <laughs> Fantastic. Name one must read business book. The must-read business book, there's more than one, but I would suggest A Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, and it's by a fellow named Richard Rummelt. 
Um, it's also available as an audio book and it's um, just really hard hitting evidence based demystification of marketing and marketing strategy. And it dispels the myth that, um, you know, some um, um, airy fairy goals are actually strategy. So it's a really good uh, read or listen, whichever way you choose to consume it. Oh, excellent. Good stuff. What was the last thing you Googled? The last thing I Googled was um, information about corporate social responsibility in Australia. Um, and um, it was in the context of its impact on uh, buying decisions within corporates. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Uh, <laughs> um, what is your most used app at the moment? Probably Slack. Um, we okay. use Slack as our internal comms tool and it's um, just been a fantastic tool for us. We um, we use it uh, all the time. It's a 24-7 app for us. Excellent. What would your one tip be for people who are studying at the moment? As quickly as possible, get some um, experience inside a business. Work for free. Um, offer yourself a half a day a week. Um, look around, you know, geographically close to your home at a business that you like or you're interested in. If you're interested in surfboards, ring up a surf shop and tell them what you're doing, that you're studying marketing and you'd like to come and spend four hours a week for them and it's going to cost them nothing and you'd like to try you know, um, uh, to uh, flex your marketing muscle inside their organisation and make sure it's good people who are going to support you and give you feedback. You want to work with a good team. But that's my number one tip. Just, just get your hands dirty. Um, and then when you're going for job interviews, if you tell an employer that you've been doing that, they will wrap their arms around you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the um, the example you gave there of surf shop isn't <laughs> that um, specific to, to the UK, uh, to be perfectly honest. But um, from your accent, I, I get where you're from. It is yes. quite important. <laughs> yes. Or perhaps, um, I don't know, a pub. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That is, the, you're probably nail on head there, I think. That's probably more likely. But if you're into that, then, like you say, absolutely dive into it and, and get that experience. Uh, Michael, final mm. question. If people want to find out more about yourself and what you do, where should they go? Sure. Look, I, they're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. So just look me up on LinkedIn, Michael Field from Evett Field Partners, or go to the website, which is evettfield.com, E V E double T F I E L D dot com. And we'd welcome, um, you know, any sort of um, questions or comments uh, from your from your listeners. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. It's been fascinating. Could speak to you all day about this stuff. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to um, hearing more of your podcasts. Michael being very, very kind there and generous at the end. Thanks so much. But what are my takeaways from that chat that I had with Michael? There's so, so many. I could be literally here all day, but I would bore you to death. So here's just three. Why is marketing important? As Michael points out, it can help companies grow and break through that plateau that other functions such as sales cannot do alone. But it needs careful consideration backed by proper analysis to be effective. Basically, it's more than just your logo, literature and website. You need to consider the actual strategic implications and we don't do that enough today. This leads nicely onto not forgetting about the fundamentals of marketing. These are the bits that people can't see or don't want to see. The research and analysis that is required to base any type of marketing tactic on top of. These are the foundations of good marketing and will place any company in good stead going forward. And finally, when thinking about the various channels we now have at our disposal, it doesn't mean we should be on all of them or spread ourselves too thin. No, no. We go where the market is. Consumer buying behaviour has driven our need for digital marketing. Digital marketing didn't drive the need for consumers to be on these platforms. It is down to us as marketers to understand where our customers are and be there when they need us. And finally on this episode, our top tip. And we continue to look at the extended marketing mix, the seven Ps, this week with physical evidence. 
So within this extended or digital marketing mix sits physical evidence. But what, do, what does this actually mean? And, and why is it a consideration at all? After all, for many businesses, e-commerce is the only platform and thus physical evidence is a non-entity. Wrong. Yes, physical evidence is far more prevalent within the service industry. But for me personally, it fits with anything and that includes products, software, hardware, service, whatever you're selling, whatever you're doing, physical evidence is massively important. Take a salon or a butcher's, for example. The smells, sounds, decor, ambience, cleanliness, colours, clothing, and even equipment is vitally important as an indicator to the quality of the service that will and is provided. But even for those organisations with very little, by the way, physical evidence, it is an important factor as including the physical in what is a non-physical landscape can be a game changer. What the hell am I talking about? Take Amazon, for example. Their physical evidence is exceptional, irrespective of their digital presence. Let's take a look at some of the key elements that I'm on about. So packaging. Amazon's packaging is usually branded. And even the tape they use to seal the packaging is either branded or utilised in some promotional way. The warehousing. Those massive things you see on the side of the road, yep, they play a part as an indicator to the vast delivery network that can get your package to you in under 24 hours. And drones. They might not quite be there yet, but the fact that this is even a possibility highlights that the company is a thought leader in their industry, pioneering new technology and looking at ways to better serve their customers. Okay, I'm off to order Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by Richard Rummelt. I need it tomorrow. No, 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 I need it now. By drone, please. Thank you so much for joining us today on Marketing Study Lab. It really means the world that you're listening to this out there. And hopefully I've provided you some value. If you're looking to know more about what Marketing Study Lab does and is about, go to marketingstudylab.co.uk or get in touch with me personally, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or feel free to email me at peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Happy marketing.